an alienable commodity that you could transfer for money. It, even in Europe, it wasn't. Like a few hundred years ago, if you were like the, the lord of Berkshire or whatever, you know, like the count of whatever, or whatever, you know, whatever your title was, that didn't mean you owned that land. You were just, you just had title. You had a title. That's what a title was. You could not sell it. You were granted title. You could grant title within your own title to barons and lords and gentle, gentle folk, you know. And then there were, there were serfs that came along with the land. The land owned the serfs. You couldn't kick the serfs off. You couldn't evict them. They, they, they came along with the land. They had an inalienable right to the land. So, you know, land wasn't property in the sense that we know it today. So this, this contagion um, of turning the world into property, it started in the West, in Western civilization, but now it's being applied everywhere on Earth um, through all kinds of ways. Some of them sound really well-meaning, like microloans to, to women in Bangladesh and India. You know, we will lend you $500 at a low interest rate to buy a milk cow, and then, you know, you pay us back, right? And this, and this, you know, it's painted as if it's empowering these women and stuff, but actually it's monetizing their economy. Um, when, when the British wanted to destroy the uh, indigenous cultures of Africa, they instituted a hut tax, 10 shillings per hut, and had to be paid in shillings. So if you lived in a subsistence, as a subsistence farmer or a hunter-gatherer, um, but it was mostly subsistence farmers in those areas, you couldn't pay that tax. Even though you were, before the British came, you were rich. You didn't have money, but you had everything you needed. And you had a, a, a web of relationships that gave you security. But now you had to pay 10 shillings a year. How are you going to do that? You have to raise commodity crops and hire, hire labor to work on them. And the whole economy becomes monetized just by that one thing. So it, that's just one of the ways that, that the realm of property, because the realm of goods and services has to grow to keep pace with the growth of money. And one way to make it grow is to find a part of the world where they do something not for money anymore, or where there's resources that are not goods yet. So you go in there, you destroy the culture so that people don't rely on each other anymore, and they have to pay for things. And you pillage the natural resources, turn them into goods. Well, what's happening today <coughs> is that the planet is running out of goods to convert into money and gifts, relationships to convert into services. We're running out of resource, we're running out of nature to convert into goods. There's no more left. We can't increase the fish catch anymore. We can't increase the oil coming out of the ground. We can't you know, process more uranium and build more nuclear power plants. We can't we can't create more services when we pay for everything, even friendship, even a wise advice, you know, even he health care was never a service, really. Hardly. Every other family had an herbalist grandmother up until 100 years ago, you know. Um, so we're running out of stuff, and that's why civilization is facing a crisis. So that's one of the levels of this crisis, that we can't grow anymore but we live in a system that demands growth. And um, some ancient people foresaw what was going to happen. Like whoever made up the myth of King Midas, whose touch turned everything to gold. Interest-bearing money, it infects everything else and turns the world into money. And so King Midas, you know, first he was hungry. So someone gave him a sausage, and he couldn't eat it because it was turned into gold, right? So sustenance, the, the richness of the soil, the aquifers, the biosphere, is being turned into money and can no longer sustain us. Um, then he wanted to, then he went to his garden for solace, and he plucked a rose to smell it. And the rose turned to gold. So again, the metaphor says beauty is being turned into gold, aesthetic nourishment, the beauty of the earth. You know, you, I, I just drive through the suburbs here where I grew up, and there's all of these ugly developments everywhere. Aspen Heights, you know, with these gigantic houses that are just imposed on the land. 
but ugly acres um, <laughs> up where I used to live. It's actually called something else, but <laughs> like, sometimes we, we, we think like, what should it actually be named? You know, <laughs> <laughs> like like you know, and I, I'm, I'm like just the, the beauty of the landscape. You know, it's 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 being converted into money. And then, so then, he starts crying. King Midas starts crying because he's hungry. His food is turned to gold. His rose is turned to gold. And his daughter comes up to hug him. And then she turns to gold, too. And so, nature, beauty, and relationship. Love being turned into money as well. So the, the ancient wisdom keepers tried to encode warnings into these stories. In Chinese mythology, there's a monster called the Tao Tia, which uh, had this huge mouth and a ravenous appetite. And it ate everything around it, consuming the whole world, everything. And when it was finished, consuming the whole world, it was still hungry. So then it ate its own body. And the image is, there's nothing left but a mouth. And that's what's happened in our economy. The, the financial system First, it converted all of the planet and the relationship into money. And I'm exaggerating here. There's still a lot of beauty left. There's still a lot of love left. And there's still a lot of nature left. But basically, it, there's not enough left to feed its appetite. So then it turned to its own body. The financial system is supposed to be the head on top of an industrial body, a body that actually makes stuff. And it began to consume that as well, financializing the economy. And now there's nothing left. <coughs> so it begins to consume itself, uh, paying off debt with more debt, which can't last very long. But that's what's happening today. You know, if, if in a debt-based system, if, if you owe me, Kevin, you owe me you know, $500,000 and you can't pay it right now, well, your payment is you know, $10,000 a month, say, <laughs> I'll lend you another 100000 Okay. okay, and you can keep paying me. Everything's fine now, right? Yeah. Like, and that that would be okay if, like, you know, you had some, you know, big, big uh, project on the way that you were going to make lots of money, right? But like in the case of Ireland, which couldn't pay its debts, so everyone got together and lent them more money so that they could pay off the bonds that were coming due at what six percent interest. So unless their economy grows by six percent same problem is going to appear again even worse and that's the situation of the whole world right now so I like to uh, it, it feels like some bad news you know that the world is falling apart and it can look pretty grim when you study, as I have, the different crises that face the planet and just how bad they are. In almost every case, they're worse than anybody says. Even if you read like the most horrifying doom and gloom accounts of nuclear waste mm -hmm. um, or what really is going on in the Gulf of Mexico, you know. And how about oil spills that haven't even made the news? And I mean just just you know, and, and what about the ticking time bomb of, of all of the abused children? Um, or I, I can just, in every realm, things are <coughs> worse than most people can imagine. So I like to frame this in a bigger context. You know, we talk a lot about unsustainability, how the system is unsustainable and therefore unnatural. But actually, in nature, there are unsustainable processes. For example, pregnancy and the cascade of hormones that leads to birth. That's unsustainable. You know, you can look at, oh my god, like this fetus is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and, and you're not going to be able to, to, to maintain that much longer, ma'am. You know, this is unsustainable. And, and it grows and grows and when it gets to a crisis point, it triggers a process a birth process. So I think what's happening today on, on, a, on a broad level is that all of these crises, all the crises that we're facing, in one way or another, 
are arising because we're pushing up against the limits of our environment. We've grown up against the limits. We can't grow anymore. This growth triggers a birth. And the crises that we're experiencing today that are just starting to really get a full head of steam up are a birth crisis. And they are propelling humanity into a new era, a new story of the people, which includes a new story of self and a new story of the world. And the birth of this new story is something that we can feel echoing in our hearts, and we're attracted to it because we're born in the transition time and we want to live in the new story. The new story of self is the connected self that says, no, we're not these separate bubbles of psychology. We're not separate souls encased in flesh. We're not selfish gene-driven phenotypes competing for scarce resources in an objective universe. We are connected. And not just that we're dependent, but our, our being, our very existence, depends on each other. So in every realm, this awareness is arising, like in ecology, for example, where you might think that, you know, if, if, if they were rid of the plague of the wolves, the deer would be much better off, <laughs> right? That's the old thinking, right? Because they're in competition with each other. If, if, or if your body were rid of all of these bacteria that have infested your gut, then you would be much better off, right? <laughs> but now we're learning that, as a matter of fact, every being has a contribution to make that, that increases the health of the, of the whole. 